Okay, good morning and welcome back. We're here for another lecture on pre-calculus. Today's lecture comes from section 5.3 on trigonometric graphs. Uh, we're not going to look at all of them. We're going to look at just sine and cosine today. Um, and quite a bit of it comes from just this, just a, just a basic fact that we're going to see here. Um, in fact, most of the graphs come from just a basic fact that we're going to look at right at the very beginning. Uh, so, um, we'll get into that, but just a, another reminder, tomorrow, the 6th, or I should say April the 6th, um, I'm recording this on the 2nd, so not tomorrow, but on April the 6th, it's a Tuesday, there's no classes, so there will be no office hours on Tuesday. Uh, I will have Zoom class on Wednesday the 7th still, so join us for that at 8, and I'll go through several problems from these trigonometric functions. Uh, unit circle sections. There's office hours on the 8th, and then there's a quiz on sections 4.3, 4.4, and 4.5 that Friday. Okay, so with that, we'll go ahead and move over to the whiteboard, and we'll get started on this section on trig graphs. So the basic fact that I was referring to was this. So first, let me draw a unit circle. We'll remember also that the sine and cosine functions take an argument which is an arc length or an angle that arc length starts at the point one zero I got it right today one zero the origin for the unit circle is, is the center for the unit circle and the arc length travels around the unit circle and ends at some point, which we call the terminal point. And that has some x coordinate and some y coordinate. And the sine function tells us that y coordinate. So you plug in some arc length t, some angle t to the sine function and it just tells you the y-coordinate. Cosine tells you the x-coordinate. Okay, It takes an arc length or an angle and outputs the x-coordinate. So a simple fact here is that if you take another angle with the same coterminal point, you're going to get the same sine and cosine value. Okay, so any angle with the same co-terminal point. Any, let me write this two ways. Any two angles with the same co-terminal point give the same x and y coordinates. That is the same sine and cosine. Okay, it may seem like a rather simple or trivial fact to bring up but what I'm saying is is very important for the graphing of sine and cosine and for understanding a property of sine and cosine that that uh, is really important this is the periodicity of sine and cosine okay they're periodic functions so here we have this first angle T it has this terminal point in green but if I take another angle going around the circle and ending at the same point, it has the same sine and cosine. It has the same tangent because of that as well. And because of that, it also has all the same reciprocal functions being equal to. So I could go around another 2 pi, right? I just take t and I go another 2 pi around. Or I go around another time. And I change this 2 to a 4. So t plus 4 pi. So I go around the circle two times and end at the same spot. So sine of t and cosine of t are equal to the sine of t 
plus 2 pi n. Simply because when we adjust our angle by adding a multiple of 2 pi, we're just going around the circle, right, another time. So we're arriving at the same coterminal point, which means the x and the y coordinates are exactly the same, which means the sine and the cosine, by definition, are exactly the same. Okay, this shows us that the period of sine and cosine is 2 pi. I don't have to write the pi, I don't have that key on my keyboard, 2 pi. Okay, the period of sine and cosine is 2 pi. So when we look at the graphs of these things, because they're periodic, we should see something repeating over and over and over again. And how frequently we see them repeating over and over and over again is this idea of period. What is the period? Right. So for sine and cosine, they will repeat themselves every 2 pi. So let's go ahead and plot sine and cosine. And we will talk about a few things about them. So let's take some axes. Okay, and a unit circle will help immensely. So if you, this is a, a tip to all of you. If you are ever concerned about graphing sine and cosine, if you're a little bit concerned, just gr draw a unit circle, put in, an, put in the positive x-axis, and just think about the definitions of sine and cosine, the x and the y coordinates. So I'll graph sine here, I'll, I'll graph it here in, blue. We'll just remember that, this, that the sine accepts an angle or an arc length. So this x-axis is our arc axis. So if I go over 1 on this axis, that corresponds to having an arc length of 1 here. Okay? So another tip for graphing sines, cosines, tangents, and the reciprocal functions is to work with the numbers which you've already got memorized. What are these memorized? Well, I, I hope that you've got these sine and cosine values memorized by this point. For these, so, uh, 0, pi over 6, pi over 3, pi over 4. I missed that one before, so listing it now. Pi over 2. Again, you should have the sine and cosine values memorized for these angles. In particular, these are the two important ones because this one you can find from those and these two are just sort of trivial. So you should have the sine and cosine values memorized at this point. If you don't, graphing is gonna be a nightmare, okay? So memorize the sine and cosine values, please, for your own help, for your own benefit, please. So how does memorizing those things help? Well, here we go. We need to know exact heights for our sine function um, at bunches of angles. So if we were to make a table, let's, let's start with an angle of zero. Well, what is the sine at an angle of zero? The y coordinate of that point is zero. Okay, let me make a mark here to represent pi, another mark here for two pi and three pi and so forth and so on. We're not gonna go with like one, two, three, four. We're gonna go one pi, two pi, three pi, four pi because 
Yeah, I'm, you should not have memorized what the sine of one is or sine two is. It's it's easier to work with just multiples of pi or fractional multiples of pi. Okay. So we know sine of zero is zero. What is sine of pi? Well, pi brings us to a terminal point here. So we're back at zero for the y coordinate. Sine of two pi brings us here again to a height of zero, a point with a height zero. So every multiple of pi for sine is gonna be zero. Okay, that's, we've already seen what's happening there. So now let's look at, how about this point? Corresponding to an angle of pi over two. What's the height of pi over two? So pi over two is right here in between there, and the height of that point is one. And that's as big as sine ever gets. It never gets larger than one. If you're talking about just the vanilla sine of t. Okay, let's keep going around the unit circle. Let's work with now this angle, which is three pi over two. We're down at the bottom of the unit circle, which means we're at a height of negative one. The y coordinate is negative one. Okay, so this, this angle here was pi over two. This one was three pi over two. And what's gonna happen here at two pi plus pi over two? Well, it's gonna be the exact same as what happens at pi over two because of the periodic, the periodic nature of sine. Right, it's what we talked about earlier. That sine of t equals sine of t plus two pi. So what happens here at three pi plus pi over two? Well, it's gonna be the same as over here. So negative one. And what happens to the left here, negative pi over two? Well, we're down at negative one again. And what happens at negative pi? Well, we're at zero again because of the repeating nature of this function. Okay, so now how about some of these other things? these other angles like pi over three and pi over six, right? And what about pi over four? Well, for these things, we're gonna remember that the sine is either root three over two or one half, okay? So which one's which? And this, this is where your ability to graph accurately is really gonna be tested. So pi over three, we're gonna try and split this into thirds. And then pi over six, split those in half. Okay, so this here is pi over six. The sine value at pi over six is one half. So we're already up here. What's the value of sine at five pi over six? Well, they have the same co, or not the same co term, they have the same reference number, pi over six and five pi over six. If you need help remembering that, we'll go right to the unit circle. Pi over six is one sixth of this entire way around, the top half. So this is pi over six. And if I go five of those, so one, two, three, four, five, how much is left? Exactly one sixth. So that means because they have the same reference number and because they're both above the x axis, they both have the exact same sine value. Well, since the sine of pi over six is one half, so too is the y uh, coordinate for five pi over six, it's one half. All right, we know the other one, it's root three over two, which is a little bit higher up here. I'm gonna just plot them without, without uh, computing that. It's bigger than one half, right? Square root of three is bigger than one, so this is bigger than one half. This gives us a nice, nice idea of what sine looks like It looks like a mound, kind of like a hill. 
in this first quadrant one and quadrant two. What about in the second and the third quadrants? Well, remember that we're going to have the exact same values for these different angles, but they're going to be all negative now. So again, when you start graphing angles down here, if you're using these same angles, which have the same reference angles, I mean, you're going to be getting the exact same heights. So for example, if you go pi over 6 further, what's the height? That's negative 1 half. So if I go pi over 6 further here, the height is negative 1 half. If I go another pi over 6 to get to pi over 3 further than pi, well, we're at negative root 3 over 2. If I go here, we're obviously at negative 1. If I go pi over 6 further, then this is pi over 6 here, this angle from here to here. If this is the same, another pi over 6 further, well, then we're still at negative root 3 over 2. And if I go another pi over 6, then we're working here with a reference angle of pi over 6 again. So we're at negative 1 half again. So this is just the symmetries we talked about in a previous lecture. Um, so we've got sine plotted. It's a little bit more roundish than what I've drawn it here, I would say. Um, but this is not a bad, not a bad graph. It's certainly accurate enough for what, what I would accept, right? So what happens for the rest of the time? Well, what I said at the very beginning is now where the, <clears throat> the power of that simple fact comes in. Sine is periodic. It has a period of 2 pi, and you can see that here. So from 0 to 2 pi. This is one entire <clears throat> wave of sine. This is one period of sine. So for the next <clears throat> section of 2 pi down the road here, down the t-axis, we're going to have an exact copy of it just shifted over. So I'm going to graph that now, and I'll graph that in pink. So this, trying my best, is supposed to be an exact copy of what we've got in this first one. What happens to the left he, over here? Well, again, it's an exact copy of this section here, just shifted to the left, 2 pi. So I'm not going to be able to graph it all here, but I'll graph the first part. <laughs> More easily said than done sometimes. Okay, and I, I can't keep going. I'm out of screen here. But this whole graph just keeps oscillating back and forth and back and forth. And at each of these multiples of 2 pi, the whole graph just starts, essentially starts over. So at every multiple of 2 pi, we're just going to get a whole new wave created. That's exactly the same as what happened in the, in the previous 2 pi. Okay, so what I'm marking out here are the periods. So this is one period of two, of sine. Here is another period of sine. Okay, now I I don't have to start at that point, so long as I choose a length which is equal to two pi on the x-axis or the t-axis, and go to the corresponding point two pi later, it's still one full period of sine. So I could pick, for example, pi over 2 to be the beginning, quote, the beginning. If I go 2 pi later, I arrive here. And then what we see is I could graph the entire thing by just repeating this part over and over and over again. Okay. So graphically, the period of the sine is, is discovered by looking at what is the repeated part.
right? The smallest of the repeated parts. Because you could certainly take you could certainly take something that's two times two pi long, and you would get this. And certainly that repeats over and over again, but you could do with less than that. Okay? If you go with something that's less than two pi, unfortunately you're not gonna have a repetition. You'll have to do transformations perhaps in order to get things flipped over or what have you, but okay, that's the period. Alrighty. Um, <clears throat> this vocabulary word here that I want to talk about, it's something that we see. Um, I don't think that your book even talks about it. So I'm going to refer to it as the central axis. Um, so what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the central axis is sometimes the t-axis, sometimes not. Okay, so right now I'm drawing a green line in and I'm going to call that the central axis. It's the center about which the sine function oscillates. It goes up and comes down, it goes up and comes down. Okay, and it's exactly halfway between, exactly halfway between the top crest, all these top crests, it's exactly halfway between the top of those crests and the bottom of these troughs. Okay, now, like I said, sometimes it's the t-axis, sometimes it's not. It does not matter where this t-axis is, it could be way down here this central axis is still that imaginary line that runs right through the middle of the sine function or right through the middle of a cosine function which we'll see shortly. Okay, so if I shifted my sine up or down, the central axis shifts with it. Okay. So here we go. Put this right back. All right. So why is the central axis important? Well, because that is the line to which you measure in order to measure the amplitude of sine. So these lines that I'm measuring, or drawing in, these are these are lines which have a length equal to the amplitude. Okay, so the amplitude of the sine function. Of the vanilla sine function, it's just one because the sine only goes up to one and goes down to negative one. So the amplitude is positive one. If I graphed two sine of t, well then all these heights are gonna be up to two and down to two and up to two and down to negative two. I think I said down to two. So down to negative two. The amplitude then is two. So when you've got something multiplied by your sine function, if you take the absolute value of that value, you're gonna get the amplitude. Okay. Um, all right. I think I think that's all the vocabulary that we need to introduce for sine. Okay, so the next thing that we'll we'll look at is what happens if you. multiply the input this is not worth the time what happens if you take a sine function and you take some multiple I want to use what your book uses k times your input t okay so what happens if you multiply your input before plugging it into the sign by some number k. Okay, we're gonna assume that k is a positive number. Okay. So this is something that you should remember actually from what we've done prior. We've talked about what happens when you adjust or transform your functions by multiplying the input, right? 
So what happens if k is bigger than one? Essentially, what happens is we're increasing our inputs, right? So sine is going to be mm, sort of taking its values on faster and faster and faster, which has the effect of squishing it together. If k is bigger than 0 but less than 1, the inputs are going to more slowly travel through the 0 to 2 pi range, which means sine is effectively stretched out. Okay, We talked about this in, in one of the previous sections a long time ago. So how can we see that on a unit circle? Let's go with one basic example. So we'll take k is 2. And I'm just going to make a short table of this. And I don't want to make it there. make it down here. So t is going to be like the original angle that we plug in. 2t is going to be the adjusted angle that we actually plug in. And then I'm going to make just a table of these things, sine of 2t. Okay. So notice I picked a number that's bigger than 1 to multiply our inputs by. And we're going to take a look at what happens. So when we start off with an angle 0, of course, 2 times 0 is 0. A sine of an angle 0 is just 0. When we pick, oh, sorry, that gives us a point right here. When we pick an angle that is not that, let's go with, like, oh, I don't know, pi over 6. That's a really nice one. Well, then multiplying by 2 gives us pi over 3. And sine of pi over 3 is different than pi over 6. Sine of pi over 3 is root 3 over 2. Right? So we've, we've already skipped over a height of 1 half. We plugged in the angle that first would give us sine of, sine of pi over 6, giving us 1 half. And now by plugging that in, we're shifted forwards in the sequence of memorized numbers to the next one, which is root 3 over 2. So you see here that because we are multiplying our input by something bigger than 1, we're going more quickly through our sequence of memorized numbers, more quickly through the, our, our, uh, our domain of the period, which is 2 pi. And we're changing what the period will be by this multiplication. So we plug in pi over 6 and we get root 3 over 2, which I'll say is right there. Let me put 1 right there. Okay. Pi over 6. So what happens when we, when we plug in something like pi over 2 then? We multiply by 2 and that gives us pi. And when we plug in pi, we're already back down at zero. That's kind of crazy. So pi over six, pi over three, pi over two. We're already back down here. Usually the angle that gives us that is halfway around the unit circle, an angle of pi. But by plugging in pi over 2, we've already gotten there because we're multiplying our input by 2. So I'm going to, now I'm just going to sort of graph what we've got. We know what it looks like. And we know where it's going to repeat now, actually. If half of the sine only took pi over 2, then the other half is only going to take pi over 2. That means when we go we just sort of pick something here. If we go through, like let's pick pi over, um, let's go with 3, uh, no, 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 
Let's go with 2 pi over 3. That'll work just fine. We multiply it by 2, that gives us 4 pi over 3. So 2 pi over 3 is right down here. So here's 1 pi over 3. Excuse me. I am not thinking correctly. That's 2 pi over 3. Four pi over three is another two pi over three further. So it's right here. All right, this this angle, this this is two pi divided into three. So that's a third of going all the way around. So we go another third all the way around, and we're at four pi over three. If we go another third all the way around, then we've arrived at two pi. So what's our what's our output here? Well, it's the negative of what we would normally get at 2 pi over 3, right? So we're at a height of negative root 3 over 2. What is our reference number there? Our reference number is pi over 3. OK, so this is going to have the same value as this one, but negative, because we're below the x-axis now. So if I plot that at 3 pi over 2, we're already down here at negative root 3 over 2. So I'm going to just go ahead and graph this second half now. I'm just trying to illustrate that we're already down here. We'll say this is negative 1. So what does our normal graph look like? Well normally at pi over 2 we're at a height of 1. And at pi we're at 0. And at 3 pi over 2 we are down at negative 1. And at 2 pi, we're up there. So normally our graph is much more slowly going through its period. But when we multiply our inputs by a number bigger than 1, we're actually increasing the frequency of our function, which means we're decreasing the period. And there's a really nice relationship, just a simple formula which you can use to remember or what you can use rather to determine the period. So I'm going to let p be the period for a sine or cosine function. They, they actually both have the exact same uh, uh, function for this. Um, so this is for sine of kt or for cosine of kt. It works for both. The period is going to be a multiple of 2 pi. And what is that multiple? it's 1 over k. We see that here illustrated in this graph of sine of 2t. Normally our period for sine and for cosine, even though we haven't graphed it yet, is 2 pi. But here I've graphed sine of 2t and we see that the period is just pi. It's half as big because we're going through our, our domain values twice as fast. So this is a nice handy formula to use. You look at a, any old sine function, you, you determine what k is, and then you can only graph angles between 0 and p, and you'll get a full period, right? And then you can just copy that all along the entire axis if you need to graph more than one period. OK? OK. Um, and amplitude I already discussed. Amplitude was uh, just the absolute value of any number that's multiplied in front of the sine and cosine. So I'm going to put here an a times sine of kt and an a times cosine of kt. So if a is positive, what changes in our graph is simply this 1 and this negative 1. Sine without the a does arrive at a maximum value of 1 and a minimum value of negative 1 one time in each period. So when sine, at the angle when sine reaches 1 and negative 1, we're going to multiply now by some constant a. So it now 
arrives at its maximum and its minimums once per period of A and negative A. Okay. So what is the amplitude? It's just A, the positive A. It could be that A is negative, in which case our graph is actually flipped about the x-axis. And that's fine. The amplitude is still the positive of A, the absolute value of it. Okay. The period doesn't change if you flip this over the x-axis or the t-axis. It doesn't change. Uh, neither does the amplitude. It just, it just is a, a reflection, right? Okay. So how can we shift sign? How can we move that central axis that I talked about before up and down? Well, that happens by simply, for me, moving the x-axis. For you, it's not so easy, right? Uh, I will leave that minus a there. Um, but I'm going to... No, I will not leave it there. Okay. So here, now what I've drawn is not just a vanilla sine graph. Let's say that this is sine of 2t. Let's say it's, let's say it's um, 1.5 sine of 2t plus 3. Okay? So what I've done is I've now said, hey, we're going to take every value that we got down here, we're going to multiply it by 1.5, and, and then we're going to add 3 to it. So take a look at the zero val values in particular. They all get shifted up 3. So our central axis now is this imaginary line, which I'll draw here in pink, which is at a height of 3. Okay. What is the amplitude of this? Well, it's still just 1.5. Right? The shifting up and down doesn't change the amplitude. What's the period? Well, it's still pi. That doesn't change a thing either. This 1.5 and the 3 doesn't change a thing. What are the maximum and minimum values of this sine function now? Well, before it took a maximum value of 1. We multiply by 1.5, so it used to take maximum values of 1.5 and minimum values of negative 1.5. Now, those values are 3 plus 1.5 and 3 minus 1.5. Okay? You know, just by looking here at this 1.5, that the maximum value is going to be 1.5 over this and the minimum is going to be one and a half below this. So this height here sort of tells you that central axis location. Okay. All right. We're going to do several more problems like this on Wednesday. Um, the latter half of this section talks about um, oh, there's something I didn't talk about yet, but the latter half of the section has you using graphing utilities to do these things, which is a, a worthwhile skill to have, being able to do that, but it's not something that we're going to cover in this, set, in this uh, class. Um, it's really not difficult to, to get a handle of. So, so first, I want to talk to you about shifting a function. left and right. So we've talked about this before. Um, if we have any old function, could be sine or cosine, and we adjust the inputs by subtracting or adding. Okay, This is a little different than what we did just a minute ago where we multiplied the x. So now we're first going to adjust by adding or subtracting. This has the effect of shifting the function's graph left and right. If you're subtracting from x, you are shift, shifting to the right. 
if you're adding to x, you're shifting to the left. Okay, so with respect to, so w, r, t, with respect to f of x, f of x minus h is shifted left if x, sorry, if h is, is shifted left if h is negative, right? We'll get a double negative sign in there, which means we'll be adding to x. And right if h is positive, because we don't have a cancellation of that negative sign, which means we're actually adding to x. Okay, <clears throat> so now let's think about sine and cosine. So if I asked you sine of t minus pi over 2, and I asked you what that graph looked like, it should not be difficult at all. You could, I would hope, take a normal sine graph. Notice there's no amplitude change. There's no vertical shift. So you should just be able to take a normal sine graph, which starts here at 0, 0. At pi is at 0 again. At 2 pi is at 0 again. And which looks something like this. It goes up to 1, down to 0, down to negative 1, up to 0. This is the normal sine graph. And what is this? Well, we're subtracting pi over 2. So pi over 2 is a positive number. So this is just a shift to the right. So our new graph is going to be starting here now. We're going to take every point and just shift it over pi over 2. So at pi over 2 now, we have this point moved over to that. Okay. So this point here at 3 pi over 2 is where this point is shifted over to. And this point here, which is 2 pi plus pi over 2, which is, goodness gracious, 5 pi over 2, you gotta do that math quick in my head there for you, is where this point is shifted over to. So what does our graph of this period look like? The amplitude is the same. Looks like that. It's just a shifting sign of t minus pi over 2. The teal one was sine of t. Okay. Yeah, I told you back when we studied that function transformation section that it might be one of the most important sections in the entire course, simply because if you really understand that, it really makes your life easy. So you're going to be graphing all sorts of trig functions from now on. You're going to be graphing functions that are shifted left and right, shifted up and down. They're multiplied by some constant, so they're vertically stretched or squished. Or you're multiplying the input by something, which means you're stretching it horizontally or squishing it horizontally. And just knowing these general facts in terms of just a function in general, sine is a function, it passes the vertical line test. Um, knowing those basic facts about function transformations really makes your life easier. So does memorizing those basic sine functions and cosine functions for common angles. <laughs> so with that, that's it for this section on 5.3 trigonometric graphs. I didn't graph a cosine function, um, but you've got all those values memorized and they're the same values of sine. They're just for different input angles, right? Okay. 
you're going to see pretty quickly that sine and cosine are very related once you start graphing them. You'll see that sine is actually just a vertical, uh, sorry, a horizontal shift of cosine. They look exactly the same, just shifted a little bit. In fact, if I had done this, made it a plus sign instead, and shifted the whole thing to the left, guess what? You would have had your, oops, you would have had your graph of cosine, at least one period of it. Nope, I didn't, didn't show that. In red, I graphed sine of t plus pi over 2. And that's going to look really familiar once you graph a cosine function. Hint, they're the same, if that, that's what I'm trying to imply here. So, all right. So with that, I'm done, 5.3. And I'm done a bit early for the lectures. So I'm going to post these now on Friday, the 2nd of April. Um, the homework for this stuff is not due until, what, the 12th of April. So I'll give you a, a bit of a, a head start here. Okay. All right. I hope it helps. I'll see you next time.